Yes, thank you so much, Amar, for that really uh, lovely introduction. I'm gonna take just a second um, and share my screen with everybody. Um, let's see, and then we'll get to present and that should be good. Uh, well, again, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I was given the task of talking about healthcare financing in the state of Massachusetts in eight minutes. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go through some of the key points. Of course, we're not gonna be able to discuss absolutely everything. Um, but as Amar said, uh, I, do, uh, I do file the Medicare for All bill in the state of Massachusetts. And so I, I think as we go through this presentation, um, we're going to be setting this up a little bit so that we can then talk about the fight for single payer. Um, but to start, let's look at where we are right now, and then I will let the other panelists take us through where we can go. Um, so healthcare funding in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We started off the presentation today um, with a conversation about Mass Health and the Health Connector. And I think that when we talk about healthcare funding, those are the two programs that sort of come to front of mind. They are the largest public health investment um, in Massachusetts. And MassHealth is the program that um, I think we talk about more. Um, it's our Medicaid plus chip for the state. So taking care of our, our low income individuals and our children. Uh, the Health Connector program though, is I think um, often used almost interchangeably with the words MassHealth. I know when I have constituents call, they'll sometimes say I'm on MassHealth and it turns out they're in health connector um, for a legislator that gets to be frustrating because they are managed by two totally different departments, which seems to make no sense. But it is because Health Connector is really about subsidized private plans. Now, MassHealth is definitely moving more in the direction of having government subsidized plans or private health insurance that is managing the mass health plans. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later on. But I think for most people, they think I'm on mass health. This is an enormous part of our budget. So this year, um, mass health is um, covering about 1.8 million residents and it's cost about $17 billion. Um, of that 17 billion though, 56% of it is federally reimbursed. And I think that that is important for us to remember as we talk about um, Medicare for all, particularly on the state level, because we, um, I think sometimes hear from people who oppose Medicare for all, oh, well, it costs too much. How will Massachusetts go on its own? Massachusetts has never gone out on its own for healthcare. We do get those federal reimbursements coming in. Um, I also wanted to note that we are not done with the budget. So all of these numbers, please remember, can be changed where the budget is with conference committee. But both the House and Senate did increase the mass health budget by about 1.4 billion over what the governor provided. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. But one of the reasons is because particularly during the pandemic, and we can argue all day that we didn't go far enough. And I, I would agree that that's very true, but we are trying to make sure we don't push people off of these programs. We've been trying to keep as many people on them as possible. Um, and so the governor's budget just simply would not have allowed us to maintain current service levels. Um, so mass health, when we talk about that traditional program, is very much that fee for service. Um, it's about $3.1 billion, and we, we call it for high quality eligible children and adults. And those um, in this year's budget, we, we tried to make sure that we were doing a few things, particularly given COVID. One is in maintaining coverage for children who age out of DCF custody, the Department of Children and Families. We made an investment in uh, early interventions services. We continue to fund chiropractic services, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, our healthcare tends to be a little siloed. Um, so getting mass health to sort of be the place where we look at patients uh, holistically is a very good idea. Um, because the state of Massachusetts has actually spent a lot of time in the last year talking about maternal health, um, we've prohibited the use of any practices that reduce uh, length of stay for neonatal intensive care cases. 
um, there are just better outcomes when people actually get health care that they need, uh, particularly infants. And we've continued adult dental coverage. Um, that is an extraordinarily expensive piece of health care. Um, it is something that the Medicare for All bill includes, though, because it is important. And we have tried, uh, we have seen over the years sort of um, limited, more and more limited coverage of that. And so we're trying to go in the opposite direction. Um, and then we have also allowed in this year's budget, Mass Health, to do something around, uh, to do, to reduce premiums, co-pays, and offer other incentives for people who participate in wellness programs. So this is a little bit of a stab at this idea that if you do invest in preventative care, then you see better outcomes and you spend less on all of the band-aids or fixing the health care issues later on. Um, we do have um, some requirements for Mass Health to do reporting related to dental coverage, and we also tried to make an investment, which I will say I'm very excited about, although you'll see we've talked very large numbers. This is only $750,000 um, in our community health centers with a family medicine residency program. Community health centers are an amazing way that we provide health care across the Commonwealth, particularly in rural areas, and if you have people do residencies, Oftentimes they end up working at the community health center. So it is one attempt at trying to provide a little bit of regional equity to healthcare. Although I will note that amount is very small compared to what the rest of our spending is. There's also 13 million. Um, so you can kind of get an idea of where priorities are for payments to disproportionate share hospitals. Now this is also still very important because disproportionate share hospitals are hospitals that have a lot of patients who are on mass health, um, Medicare, Medicaid, however we want to, uh, med, well, obviously Medicaid is part of MassHealth, but um, MassHealth or Medicare. So they come in at lower reimbursement rates. Um, so we see uh, some of the larger hospitals in Boston that are paid higher reimbursement rates because they have more private pay uh, patients, whereas other hospitals, Holyoke Hospital here in Western Massachusetts being a great example, has far more patients on MassHealth. And so the state does step up and try to bridge that gap a little bit for them. Then we have, uh, as part of our Mass Health program, Mass Health Senior Care, and um, I heard some conversations earlier as uh, where we were talking about PCAs. This is where the state is trying to do a personal care allowance um, for patients who are in nursing homes or rest homes. You will see that that allowance is extremely, extremely small. So I would agree with the previous speaker that the need for advocacy around this is enormous. Um, but this program, when we're talking about uh, nursing homes and rest home and community setting coverage. We're really talking about this in the short term. So I want to make sure that we're not conflating this with long-term care. Um, this is really reimbursement for, um, like, as we see, 20 days of medical leave of absence, observational periods, 10 days of non-medical leave of absence. So we're really talking about just kind of um, providing the most basic, the most sort of, I don't want, mm. I don't want to say bottom of the barrel, but the, the kind of the, you know, the bare minimum that can be done to make sure that people who need these facilities can get to them for a brief period of time. But I do want to emphasize that this program is really not uh, the solution. It is, however, a very expensive program to run. Um, and as you can see, um, we have this, the Medicare um, savings program for low income individuals that sort of helps to bridge that gap. But again, we are really looking at a very small fragment of the population because we're, we're helping people who make less than $1,000 a month incredibly important to do, but I would also argue that someone who makes $1,500 a month is probably not in a better position to fully pay those Medicare premiums and receive these services. Um, then we have the supplemental rates for nursing homes, um, which will go into things like paying, in, well, they're supposed to go into paying hourly wage, wage increases, shift differentials and bonuses. Um, I think that a lot of this did come because of the pandemic in this year's budget, um, because we have heard so much about direct care workers and the need to in, maintain or increase staffing at a lot of these facilities. Um, and how very difficult that has been. Um, we have seen, I think we all know, outbreak after outbreak at nursing homes across the state. And so the arguments were made that this was important. Again, this is only $3.9 million though of our healthcare spending in the Commonwealth. 
And then the program that I think we, we think a little bit less about when we think about state-funded health care, and that's the GIC program. And if you're a state worker or a municipal worker, this is probably something you think about a lot. Um, but I, it, it does take up a significant chunk of our state dollars, our health care spending dollars. Um, it's about $1.8 billion that the state is subsidizing for um, premiums and plan costs, again, for state and municipal employees. Um, this is definitely run by private insurers and subsidized by the state. So um, I think the one sort of general theme we're seeing from all of these state programs is that there's a very consistent public and private partnership, but the state is uh, very consistently kicking in money for this, which I think is um, important for us to remember as we talk about Medicare for all that the state is always and already paying for many of these programs, at least in part. Um, and I'll just note that, you know, we did this year put in reporting requirements for uh, for the GIC if they're planning on changing any schedules of copays and deductibles. And then finally, um, there are a lot of other programs, other healthcare spending programs that the state is involved in. I mean, and we sort of went through and, and listed them off, and I won't talk about each one in detail, although there is a significant amount of money spent both to uh, fight fraud, um, and that would be on the, the patient side, fraud and abuses in the mass health system, as well as fraud uh, within the healthcare agency, so misappropriation by, by hospitals or other healthcare facilities. Um, we also spend uh, a fair amount of money on CHIA, the Center for Health Information and Analysis, um, they do things like maintain the all payer claims database. Um, so this is, uh, this is, I think, I would argue that Chia is actually money well spent by the Commonwealth, but, but it is still um, a lot that we are investing, I think, in healthcare infrastructure and not necessarily in healthcare. So what are the key takeaways? I think the thing that I want people to remember as they're looking at all of these very big numbers is that our government is very much involved in health insurance. The spending is for healthcare infrastructure because if you noticed in this presentation, we didn't talk a lot about public health investments or preventative care. In fact, in the House budget, we didn't invest anything in public health. The Senate did a little better. They got $3 million for public health um, and that's now in conference committee. So we're going to be arguing the House's version, which was zero and the Senate's version, which was 3 million. Um, I think that that's a shame, particularly given the way that we have seen our local boards of public health and public health in general step up during the pandemic to provide um, both testing and vaccines and information to the public. When we talk about vaccine hesitancy, our local boards of public health have really played an amazing and key role because they have a long history of running clinics like this for our towns. Um, Cost, although we didn't, I didn't graph out where our, our spending has come, but where our spending has been and where we are going, our costs do continue to increase every year. Um, and I think that that's an important note, an important thing to note, because if you look at how we're investing in infrastructure, all of those investments in infrastructure don't actually do anything to drive down healthcare spending. We're, we're kind of consistently there holding up the bottom of the bucket, right? Because we don't want things to fall out. And final point, we continue to limit enrollment to drive down costs because we're only helping the people at the very, very, who are the very, very most vulnerable, the very, very low um, low income earners. And it means that we have, when we're looking at state spending, a lot of money going to help very, very few people, although, um, and then although important, and then a large chunk of the population right above that, that is still not quite getting the assistance that they really need. Now, we do provide those subsidies for Health Connector, um, but I think that um, we're going to see, um, and particularly uh, if the governor had his way with the budget, we're going to see more and more people limited in their ability to enroll, enroll in these programs. You know, I'll, I'll note that this already happened during the pandemic. One of the things that we saw when uh, people went on unemployment and they got additional um, 
benefits was that they they were at risk of um, of being kicked off of mass health because they do have to report their income or they were being kicked off a uh, health connector because of those subsidies. Now we were able to go in and say, no, uh, we're going to put a, a hold on for six months and you're not going to be able to look at those, that extra $300 a week that someone on unemployment is getting. Um, but it does show you how very much at the cusp a lot of people are um, from getting kicked off of these programs. And um, and while I don't, and while we do continue to increase every year the amount that one can make in order to be on mass health or to get a subsidy, um, generally very small amounts based on inflation, uh, I do think that we have to have a little bit more of a plan in place for when we uh, see wages, the minimum wage increase, when we do see, hopefully, uh, continued benefits coming down from the federal government in cases like this, um, and really try to figure out how we get all of those people who are making $1,500 a month or a family that's making $2,000 a month, how do we get them into these programs and make sure that they too can afford health care? So with that, I will uh, pass it over to the next panelist and I look forward to taking questions. Great, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Lindsay. That was really informative. I learned so much. Um, awesome. So next up, uh, I mean, all all the um, a, a, the Mass Peace Action Fund Healthcare Not Warfare group for me. Uh, every every person in that group is like kind of a mentor to me, and uh, that's true for our next uh, speaker as well, uh, Sandy Eden. Uh, Sandy is a retired uh, registered nurse. Uh, he previously, I believe, was a board member of uh, the Mass uh, Nurses Association, and uh, I think he's a very uh, important and valuable and committed activist in this space. So it's a real honor to have Sandy with us today. Sandy. Uh, Sandy, we cannot hear you. Um, let me see if you're muted on this end. Uh, okay, see if you can unmute, no. There we go. Yeah. Thanks, Amar, very much. Uh, I'm uh, sort of humbled to be following uh, this whole day of uh, remarkable speakers. Um, one thing about living long enough is that you accumulate a, 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 a wealth of information, and I'll try to uh, winnow it down uh, to uh, key points. Uh, I was uh, present at the founding of MassCare, which is short for the Massachusetts Campaign for Single Payer Healthcare, back in 1994, 1995, and I've been with it uh, all along. So I've become uh, fell into the role of the uh, group's historian. So uh, uh, I'll try not to dwell on that too much, except to say that Massachusetts has a long history of attempts to enact um, uh, single-payer universal health care. In, uh, um, in the 80s, there were legislative leaders and, and a governor, uh, Mike Dukakis, uh, who professed uh, support uh, for uh, uh, a single-payer, but uh, it never quite got enacted then. Then came along a very dramatic uh, event in 1991, the uh, neoliberal transformation of health care. Uh, the deregulation of hospital finance was sort of a nodal point in, in putting the marketplace uh, in charge uh, of healthcare, and uh, uh, various sectors rebelled. The nurses rebelled uh, starting in 1993, and for 25 years, uh, uh, led a campaign that led down to question one in, in 2018, where the medical industrial complex spent, in my estimate, up to $30 million to crush it. Uh, the docs came together to form the ad hoc community to defend healthcare uh, with other clinicians. Uh, nurses joined them to help them uh, learn how to organize. And uh, that came to, up to question five in the year 2000, which made some attempts at some fundamental healthcare reforms in Massachusetts. Lost uh, in November of that year, uh, 48 to 52, very close. Uh, and then, of course, um, um, groups came together. Groups had been coming together in um, Massachusetts Jobs with Justice. Uh, uh, labor organizations, uh, a number of civic organizations, um, the um, uh, local Boston of Democratic Socialists of America, and so forth came together. And uh, in 1994, there were a battery of non-binding uh, local ballot questions uh, uh, calling for the enactment, uh, calling on legislators to enact uh, a, a, a single payer universal health care in Massachusetts. 
uh, almost all of them carried in 1994. So in 1995, we felt confident enough that, that uh, Jobs of Justice could launch um, a coalition that would focus on changing the, changing the scene. And uh, that came together, we grew, we had a hundred uh, local and, and statewide uh, uh, organizations coming together, including the uh, uh, New England Conference of the United Methodist Church, UE, many unions and so forth. Uh, what happened um, was that the uh, industry was so uh, uh, shaken, particularly the, uh, the uh, uh, insurance part that in uh, uh, 2001, uh, in the wake of our near victory in 2000, uh, created um, the Mass uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts Foundation, whose purpose was to change the dialogue uh, around healthcare policy in Massachusetts from access to care to access to insurance. And that's what got enacted in Massachusetts eventually. And, uh, and um, it be it's become quite a, quite a problem since then because the marketplace doesn't give a damn about uh, uh, people's health. Um, since uh, MassCare was founded, it, it's, uh, it and it's more, more precisely its constituent uh, coalition partners uh, had third, conducted 36 local ballot questions uh, in municipalities, in uh, state rep and state senate districts. For example, uh, in 1998, Quincy, uh, the ballot question carried by 77.7%. .7 in Somerville, the citywide ballot question in 1999 um, uh, single payer carried by 84%, 84%. So it, this is the people's choice and the opposition, uh, uh, the, the folks who profit from the status quo uh, have gone out in every way to uh, keep us from moving forward. Um, after MassCare was founded, we, start, we formulated a bill, very simple, uh, without a financial piece initially, and it grew more sophisticated with each two-year legislative session. And it's never come out of uh, the healthcare committee, or it's now uh, since uh, reorganization at the state house of the healthcare finance committee. But we've been building and, and building strong. MassCare had a meeting of its advisory board in uh, early in uh, 2007, and uh, Mel King, some may remember him as a uh, leader in the African American community in Boston, uh, a leader in the peace movement, a leader uh, at the, in the legislature for a number of uh, of, the, of years and an almost successful candidate for mayor in 19, Boston in 1983. Uh, he looked around the room and saw that he was the only person of color and pointed out that if the folks most impacted uh, by the healthcare crisis, most hurt by this current system, uh, aren't a uh, part of it and giving leadership to it, uh, we're not gonna get anywhere. So we began to take some uh, stock in that and have tried to find ways to, uh, to reach out. The last few years, I think we've made some major in inroads in that we now have a board that uh, is much more diverse, is, has a, uh, I would probably say a majority of folks uh, tied one way or another to the labor movement. Uh, we have the Mass Senior Action Council, um, Massachusetts Jobs with Justice, the teachers, the nurses, uh, and, uh, and uh, several uh, SEIU locals and others. So um, we're growing. We also um, uh, looked uh, toward, uh, well, two areas of work, ideological and political. I think Vaughn brought out the ideological uh, needs uh, that we have to see beyond the propaganda of uh, the marketplace mentality uh, that, that would run in continuously. And, um, and, and, we do educational work. We also have a newsletter, brochures, uh, and we're all prepared to do another uh, a round of ballot questions when the uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, shut us down. And we, it took us a while to figure out how to get out there and collect signatures and get things uh, into an area we can do, where we can do that. We had tremendous success uh, having town meetings uh, and, uh, and getting the word out uh, to people. Uh, we've decided, uh, Certainly, uh, I live in Quincy. We lost our city hospital uh, um, a couple of years ago, uh, in part, I'd say in large part, uh, due to in unequal financing because of uh, folks being poorer in Quincy than in Newton, not to pick on anybody. And we've, we've seen us uh, lose um, uh, hospital, uh, a hospital in Lynn, including the, the uh, emergency room. I would say that one argument that we've been using, and I think effectively, is that uh, a single payer financing system like expanded and improved Medicare for all values 
everyone's health, that is everyone's life equally, and will help pull the rug out, undermine the financial uh, uh, underpinnings of medical redlining, uh, as others have spoken, the uh, communities that are denied their care. Um, they lose facilities, they, they lose um, uh, uh, programs, particularly programs that help poor families, uh, uh, maternity, pediatrics, uh, substance abuse, uh, uh, mental health, and so forth. So all I can say is organization gives strength. Please uh, consider um, uh, becoming a hub in your com community, place like the G uh, JP, Jamaica Plain Progressives, have uh, uh, adopted uh, this campaign as uh, as one of its own, uh, or groups like Western Mass Medicare for All and uh, South Shore Medicare for All uh, have brought activists together uh, to work on their legislators uh, to move them uh, uh, to get in touch uh, with Representative Sabadosa, uh, um, uh, Senator Eldridge, and, and others to get get involved. But it takes pressure from below to get the job done. Um, everybody in, nobody out. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Sandy, that, that was wonderful. All right, so uh, moving right along, uh, it looks like um, it's no one's fault, but it looks like we'll go a little bit over five. So uh, if anybody has commitments and they have to leave, we totally understand, but uh, we, this is being recorded and we'll be sure to share the video around with everyone so uh, they, they won't miss anything. Next up, we have uh, Natalia Linos. She is a research scientist, and uh, she's also the executive director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University. Uh, she's a friend of Mass Peace Action and has spoken at our events before, and she previously ran for Congress, and she provides us much uh, insight and information about COVID and public health. So it's really great to have uh, Natalia here with us today. And uh, let me see, okay, here we go. There she is. Uh, are you, let me see if I can unmute you on this end. Fast mute. Thank you so much, Amar. And thank you to the Mass Peace Action for the invitation today. It's truly been um, wonderful sitting in from two o'clock and listening to everyone. And I was asked to speak a bit about COVID uh, vaccination access, although I should specify that I'm a social epidemiologist and not a frontline healthcare worker as many of the people on the call today are. And I'm not part of a community group that has been providing vaccines during the pandemic. So it's sort of, you know, from a research perspective, taking a step back. But I do think it's important to, to highlight that, you know, the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights sees obviously healthcare as a human rights. And what we've been working on during the COVID pandemic is to document and speak out about the health inequities we're seeing in this country, especially vis-a-vis -vis racial lines. And in March, 2020, when there had been just one death in the US um, from COVID, Mary Bassett, who was the former New York City Health Commissioner, but now directs the center, and I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post where we called out specifically our, you know, structural racism. We called out the fact that there were so many Americans who were uninsured. We called out the anti-immigrant sentiment and basically said a warning call that the US could not, even though we're one of the wealthiest countries, some of the best scientists that we would be likely be one of the countries that would have the biggest toll from COVID um, if we didn't take health equity seriously. And that was when we had one death. And sadly, so many of those projects predictions came true. And I want to add that I'm so grateful to everyone who mentioned the Poor People's Campaign. In April, just a month later, Reverend Barber actually reached out and set up a COVID-19 Health Justice Advisory Committee and said to us, you know, every movement needs a footnote. And I think that places like Harvard researchers can be that footnote. And that's the service we tried to provide, ensuring that he and others had the latest data. Um, they knew how to speak about the inequities they were seeing and that they could rely that, you know, we had that information. So, let me say also, finally, that I'm speaking about Massachusetts, but I did grow up in Greece. My parents are healthcare, healthcare workers there. Um, I moved to the US when I was just 17 and worked in the UN for over a decade. So I'm really, really glad that someone else will speak about health inequities because at the moment, it is the global inequities that are really the most striking ones. And I think Christopher Noble at the end will talk about that, but it's hard to speak about vaccine access and not highlight that that huge inequity that we're seeing globally. So what, what are we seeing in Massachusetts? And according to our latest data, Massachusetts is actually doing really well. Um, you know, we are currently ranked third 
of the US states with persons that have at least one dose. And if we limit it to states that have more than a 5 million uh, population, we actually rank first. And that means there's a lot we can celebrate. This wasn't the trajectory many of us uh, were seeing early on, and there was a lot of worry. But I should say that there is still work to be done, both on an equity lens, right? So we know that across the state, 61% of white residents have received at least one vaccine, but only 43% of Hispanic and 45% of Black residents have. Those numbers might be sound smaller than ones you've heard because I'm intentionally using our entire population. I'm including children. I'm a mom of three young children, uh, an eight-year-old and four-year-old twins. And often I feel that the conversation around vaccines, we're talking about those eligible and somehow that has led to us maybe rushing into policies, you know, taking off masks because we've forgotten about the entire under 12 population that's unvaccinated. Um, and I think so it's important to be using the general population in our denominator. So, you know, what I highlighted is that we have disparities um, by race and ethnicity. We also have them by geography. So Ashish Jha, who is the Dean of the School of Public Health at Brown, uh, recently tweeted, and he was kind of covered in the Boston Globe around, you know, the difference, his hometown is Newton, uh, where 99% of those 30, age 30 and above have received at least one vaccine and compared it to Springfield where, where the number is just 64%. So we have geographic, we have racial um, inequities that have to be uh, closed. And I'm grateful to the community groups that were pushing from day one for this to be the priority, um, as well as many people, you know, in our, our local government, there was the uh, Vaccine Equity Act, sponsored by Senators Becca Rauch, Sonia Chang Diaz, and Representative Liz Miranda and Mindy Dome, who that highlighted these inequities and and actually spelled out some solutions. So let me talk a little bit about solutions because it does get a little bit depressing. So what did we do wrong? First, we had just an online, um, you know, sign up, and it was a first come first serve. Clearly, the privilege that people have both in terms of having Wi-Fi, having time, you know, if you're not an essential worker trying to log on, having a young, you know, child that is educated who can do it, you know, that clearly was a big issue in our basic infrastructure. Um, and when we moved to offer other systems, whether it was by phone or the pre-registration, we saw some of the inequities shrinking. Um, there was also a change in kind of the modality of how do you provide vaccines? Um, do you do it in max vaccination sites where you can get your numbers up really quickly, but you might miss and therefore accidentally or unintentionally or knowingly uh, widen the inequities because, you know, those who have access to a car, who have um, other benefits, you know, can take time off work, um, are more likely to be able to utilize them. So we saw the local pop-ups and, you know, the event at uh, Ray Reggie Lewis during Black History Month that uh, Vanzella spoke about is one that everybody highlighted as really a success story. And, you know, also as Representative Sabadosa mentioned, in partnership with local health departments, there have been home-based vaccines. At first, they were only for um, the homebound people who were unable to get out of their homes. And now they've expanded that to try and reach more people. So there have been, you know, significant changes to the modality, how you sign up and where you get your vaccine. What has been also uh, reassuring is to see the considerations of the structural barriers. You know, why are people unable to access um, care during regular times, but also in this specific situation, vaccines? Often it is because they don't have access to transportation. So the free rides that are being offered is a good lesson. And I'm highlighting them because I think there are lessons that we can take to our broader conversation of how do we ensure that people have access to care, even if and when, and I hope we do get to a, a system, a single payer system, there will be structural barriers for utilization. So, you know, thinking about access in terms of um, physical transportation. The other one that I have seen recently is the free childcare, right? The YMCAs and other centers are allowing you to drop off your kids while you get vaccinated for a few hours or the day. Uh, paid leave from work to be able to do that. You know, we had different companies announce it. You know, I think Trader Joe's was one of them. Otherwise, they would give a day off for vaccines. But, you know, recognizing that those are real impediments to access um, is important because early on, the narrative was one around hesitancy. And I'm not going to undermine that. There is hesitancy. And I think, again, Vanzella talked about it, and there's justifiable um, reluctance and mistrust in institutions. But there's 
also real access challenges. And when you are already feeling a little unsure, if you're making it difficult for people, they have to travel really far, they have to pay, they have to take a day off work, then obviously we will see widening um, inequities in access in our, our rates. So as we look to the future, you know, what are some of the learnings? And I would say that this framing of responsibility is a critical one. Um, you know, too often in health and public health, we talk about disparities and then blame the people who are doing worse. We say, you know, uh, Black Americans have been dying at higher rates and that's because they have higher comorbidities. And we stop there. We don't talk about the things that, you know, Vanzella Bryant spoke about around redlining, around air pollution, around why some communities have these underlying conditions. So that shift from a victim blaming narrative of who is getting sick and why they're dying of COVID to one that considers workplace exposures, who is an essential worker, why are they being, um, you know, who has access to work from home, who doesn't, who is living in multi-generational households because they can't afford to, you know, and therefore can't afford to quarantine if they're exposed, et cetera. And that's similarly, that victim blaming narrative, did we did see it with the hesitancy versus access. So a lot of our work at the FXB Center has been focused around vaccine access because we're worried about playing into that narrative that some communities are more hesitant. Um, and as we look at the data right now, we're seeing that some of the, you know, the biggest divide is actually around uh, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. So in the long term, and I, I know I only have one minute, I just want to end by saying that, you know, COVID showed us that we can come together, that we can come together, put real money into finding treatment, into finding vaccines, into rolling it out, making it free from everyone. I don't want it to end now. We need to make sure that we continue the coalitions, the scientists and the communities to say that every, whether we have, we're talking about HIV or non-communicable diseases, that we have that investment in public health. And that would be the silver lining that I hope um, is what we, get out of um, this horrible tragedy is a truer understanding of what it means to invest in public health and healthcare. Thank you so much, Omar. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. That was really great. And you made some excellent points. I look forward to watching the video and listening to everyone's uh, great presentations again, because there, there's so much here. And uh, um, I'm going to have to go back and make sure I, I caught everything. All right. So next up, we have uh, two uh, great speakers left, uh, last but not least, uh, by any means. And then we'll uh, wrap up with some questions for the evening. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Mr. Martin Fleck. Many people on this call here today, they uh, are probably familiar with the group uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility. And uh, it's a very uh, important group uh, in, in our space. And uh, Martin Fleck, uh, who's joining us today and speaking next, he is the director of the Nuclear Weapons Abolition Program for Physicians of Social Responsibility. And of course, uh, nuclear um, abolition is an uh, issue that is uh, very important to mass peace action. We have a nuclear disarmament working group. So without further ado, I will pass the floor to Martin. Hey, thanks, Amar. Uh, man, thanks to Massachusetts Peace Action for putting on this event. Um, really amazing. And I honestly, I've been here to listen as much as I have been here to speak, and I've, I've learned a ton. Uh, and Amar, I'm, you know, I'm modeling you're, uh, you're modeling the, uh, the headphone look. I, I find it's easier to hear everybody. So um, yeah, so I work for PSR. I'm gonna make this really brief. Um, we're providing a health voice on the issues of climate change and nuclear weapons. Uh, and we're, but we're also striving towards a just transition to a care, the care-based economy that we heard about from Heidi Hoekst of National Nurses United at the beginning of this, of this event. Um, so a just transition sounds good, but PSR is mindful of the massive political power we're up against as we seek a more just and sustainable future. And we're keen to change the power equation, as is, I think, everybody that I've heard from <laughs> on this entire panel today. Uh, we want to change the power equation here in the United States so that the fossil fuel industry and the military industrial complex don't get to call the shots on what gets funded and what does not. Uh, these industries are well-funded, well-lobbied, uh, and they have no problem with the, with the status quo. So we're gonna have to figure out a way to um, outpower them. Um, earlier, Senator Markey quoted Biden. It's an amazing quote of Biden's where he says, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. 
So, well, now Biden has shown us his budget and we're not 100% happy with it. Um, PSR has been taking a preliminary look at it. Uh, don't ask me for a lot of details about this budget yet. It just came out, but credit where credit is due. Um, we see that he's increasing funding for the CDC, which seems very prudent, and uh, for the Community Mental Health Services block grants, which also seems very prudent. Um, but more on the imprudent side, um, we witnessed last year that even mid-pandemic, Congress rubber-stamped a $740.5 billion military budget. And the budget that Biden just released takes that even higher, not much higher, a little bit higher, to $753 billion. I didn't have time to get out my calculator and figure how many millions of dollars per minute that is, but it's too much. Um, Trump's budget, which is the budget that we're operating off of this year, funded nuclear weapons in there at $44 billion. Biden proposes to take the overall nuclear weapons budget down a billion, but his budget keeps, we're very disappointed, his budget keeps all of the nuclear weapons programs that Trump funded. No nuclear weapons are canceled. Talk about tone deaf. We feel that PSR's role, our niche as it were, and, and what we're called upon by our coalition partners is to bring the health professional voice into the fight for a just transition. Uh, and we wanna build up that voice with larger numbers of health professionals with diversity and geographically spread around the country. And frankly, a lot of our PSR activists, especially on the war and peace side are you know in my age group and we're aging out and we need to, you know, you've heard it a million times from people in the peace group. We need to bring in young folk. So this year, PSR is proactively, intentionally, and carefully embarking on a program about rethinking security with health in mind. Our theory is that in the immediate aftermath of the, of the pandemic, health professionals are even more motivated than they were before to shift our country's spending priorities. We feel like now is a time where we could bulk up PSR uh, and other groups that are working for, to, for this um, just transition. And everything that I've heard here today supports that idea. So we started surveying medical students that are within the PSR universe, uh, and they reacted positively to this program about rethinking security with health in mind. And they saw it as a way, they've said that they see it as a way to express their desire to be of service to society and promote healing on a larger scale, which is really what it is that drives young people to get involved in medicine to begin with. So we're being very intentional about this. We've hired consultants to help us craft a campaign that can attract young health professionals. Oh, and I wanna put this in chat, speaking of attracting health professionals. I'm showing my, showing my age group right there and what it takes for me to put something in the chat. Okay. Um, so uh, we are looking to attract young health professionals and this month we'll be putting together a working session um, with our consultants. Uh, and the idea is to have 24 young health professionals. The, the first time we tried to do this, we were scheduled for May 13th and some of you actually were invited to that. And it, ultimately we decided we did not have the group of people that we needed in order to figure out what motivates health young health professionals. So this time we're gonna to put together an event with nothing but young health professionals. Uh, and we wanna listen to them carefully, professionally, and understand what motivates them to action. So if you are a, a health professional, and I've seen a few present today who are health professionals who are under 35 years old, please take the survey. Uh, it's there in the chat. We are determined to carry out this project thoroughly and well, and if we succeed, we will expand and diversify the health voice that PSR provides. Um, the other thing is, of course, PSR is in coalition with some of the people that we've heard from today. There's a group called People Over Pentagon that includes the Win Without War uh, Coalition, Public Citizen, the Poor People's Campaign. You heard Senator Markey describing the amendment last year to cut 10% from the overall military budget. Later this year, we're expecting Jayapal and Pokan, uh, Representative Jayapal, Pokan, Lee, and Senators Markey and Sanders, and hopefully other senators, to push again for a 10% cut. They brought it to a vote last year, 
We're looking for them to bring it to a vote again this year. And that is gonna be an opportunity for everybody who's on this Zoom today to get involved and, and, and push for that. And I know Massachusetts Peace Action is highly organized and that you really go after your congressional delegation. So great. Those of you who aren't maybe in Massachusetts, think about your dele delegation. Um, PSR wants that money diverted to strengthening public health. I'm gonna say one more thing and I'm gonna stop, which is overtaken by events. This is something I worked in DC for, you know, I started working at the national office in 2013. Within the first week that I was in my national office, I learned a new uh, acronym and that's OBE. And I wonder how many people know what that stands for, OBE. Overtaken by events, okay? Just think about the Obama agenda, right? When he came in, that, that very ambitious agenda and what he, what he was actually able to accomplish because Obama himself was overtaken by events. Um, that helps explain why sometimes in the movement, we fail to be proactive. We fail to um, be really thorough in our work, you know, and in, in systematic in our work. Uh, and we fail to think about how to build up capacity and bring in new people. So I just wanted to throw that out there that, that we're, this, this, uh, this year PSR is working on this project among others, but we're determined not to be overtaken by events. And we're gonna follow this through to its conclusion. So thanks. Great, thank you, Martin. I'm so glad you shared that survey in the chat because uh, one, one of my hopes from this uh, forum today is that uh, you know we have so many great people on the call and I, I hope that from this, uh, it'll increase uh, collaboration and working together in some sort of capacity. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you got to share that survey and hopefully uh, future things. All right, uh, last but definitely not least, uh, our closing speaker for the third panel is uh, Chris Noble. Chris uh, is an activist and an organizer. He organizes with a group called Free the Vaccine. He also is with another group called Right to Help Action. Uh, and we'll hear more about this from Chris. He also has an MPH. Uh, he's a new friend to me, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from Chris and uh, what, what he has to say. So without further ado, let me uh, pass the floor to Chris. Oh, sorry. Great, thank you, Amar, and thank you everyone for having me today. Uh, my name is Chris Noble, and as Amar mentioned, uh, I'm, an, I'm an organizer with, with two groups I'll be talking on today, uh, Right to Health Action and Free the Vaccine. I just wanted to start by saying I'm, I'm personally called to this work as someone who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes as an early age. I am insulin dependent in order to stay alive, um, and so I have an intimate understanding of the necessities of a fully functioning healthcare system. And now I'm acting in solidarity to try to ensure that those same opportunities for, for accessible health care is, is, is worldwide. So just wanted to start with a quick background of who I am. Um, but today I am going to be talking about an organization that I organize with, uh, Right to Health Action, and what we're calling our People's Pandemic Prevention Plan. So quick background to Right to Health Action. So we're actually 125,000 activists strong across the country. Um, we originally launched during the first week of lockdown during COVID-19, so we're a little over a year old. And since then we've become a nationwide grassroots movement across all 50 states. Um, we're a collection of activists, students, scholars, health workers, and really grounded in the experiences of people directly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a quote from one of our leaders who's a state captain in North Carolina. After 19 agonizing days in a crowded hospital in India, uh, her grandmother died of COVID-19. Without action from the Biden administration to ramp up global vaccinations, my grandfather will not get the vaccine until 2024. Millions more will die. The pandemic will not be over anywhere until the virus is stopped everywhere. So I wanted to just ground us in that story. I'm sure we all have experiences here of how awful this last pandemic was. And I really want us all to think about, well, what can we do now to not just stop COVID as quickly as possible, but also build back better and prevent pandemics of the future. So this is what we've done as an organization in the last year. You know, we've trained our grassroots organizers in across 50 states to lead these direct actions. We have, mem we have meetings with members of Congress and hold teach-ins monthly. We actually hold over 100 different meetings, around 100 different meetings a month. So we're very active across all 50 states. Um, we have congressional sign-on letters, we meet with members of Congress, we write letters to U.S. leadership. Um, we're doing everything we can 
to really make an impact and, and have make sure that our actions result in change as quickly as possible. So here's a quick background to the People's Pandemic Prevention Plan. I'm gonna be talking about two of our kind of four pillars, but just so you all can get a sense of what we're fighting for. Um, first and foremost, we're trying to enact a, a $20 billion global fund that will stop outbreaks at the source, uh, these zoonotic diseases that I'll be getting into in a moment, build towards universal health care and stop major drivers of pandemics, deforestation and climate change. As we're seeing, those are linked inherently for the zoonotic transfer. Now we're all also working on a new deal sized public health jobs program. Uh, some call this health force uh, to fight racial justice disparities. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about that today, but I'd be happy to talk about it at a future panel. Um, and I am also gonna be talking about how to ensure publicly funded vaccines and medicines are free and available to everyone everywhere. Um, and our fourth pillar, which I also will be talking a little bit about, but how can we stop corporations whose irresponsible practices and supply chains contribute to tropical disease spillovers? So there's our website. You can check out the 4P and, and some greater information around that. But today I'm gonna to start off by talking a bit more about the Global Pandemic Prevention Fund. And this is an effort to, as we're calling it, a pandemic proof the planet. So we all know, unfortunately, these pandemics are accelerating in frequency and ferocity. New zoonotic diseases, so diseases that transfer from animal to human hosts like COVID-19, have increased sixfold since 1980. And we know that we are not safe until everyone is safe. And the next outbreak uh, with the potential to kill millions is likely just around the corner. So we were fortunate, I hate to say it, that COVID-19 was not as severe as other zoonotic diseases that we're aware of, namely Ebola, Zika, to name a few. And so we need to do everything that we can to ensure that if this next zoonotic transfer occurs, what type of global infrastructure can we have in place to stop it at its source and not turn it into a full-fledged pandemic like we're seeing today? So here's a quick background. What do we actually need to, to end these pandemics at the source? And so one of our pillars of, the, of Right to Health Action is our Global Fund to End Pandemics or the Global Fund of Pandemic Prevention. And we see this as a $2.5 billion investment in seed funding, which would be a multilateral financing mechanism that would rapidly accelerate pandemic preparedness and prevention. So this $2.5 billion would really have two components to it. It would need to first not just contain the, the pandemics at their source, so investing in local health systems, ensuring contact traces are invested, you know, ensuring that there's a local healthcare system that is able to, you know, work on the ground at the point of care to ensure that people have the health care that they need and, you know, also invest in strong health systems, disease surveillance and, and, you know, outbreak response and travel restrictions, but also really get at the source. So where are these pandemics coming from? How is it that these zoonotic diseases are increasing sixfold in the last 40 years? And so what does that look like? You know, we need some potential land use changes and, and how can we adjust the wildlife trade that are major drivers of the zoonotic disease increases? And how can they be stopped with investment in community health care, sustainable jobs and support for enforcement? And I'll get into this model a little bit more next. And some good news, there's actually movement on this effort for a global fund of pandemic prevention. Just last week, as, as was referenced before, President Biden's budget was released. Um, it did include a $250 million investment for this fund, which does, which does show that a global fund for pandemic prevention is happening. Now, $250 million is only 12.5% of what is truly needed to pandemic proof the planet. And additionally, which I'll get into later in the presentation, you know, this budget, this budget did not include any new provisions to get vaccines out to the world. Even though as little as, for as little as $25 billion, the world could vaccinate, we could vaccinate everyone everywhere in the world and ensure equitable distribution of the vaccines. And I'll get into that as, as I said a little later. So let's go back to this pandemic prevention model. So this is a proven model that actually was uh, piloted by a group called Health and Harmony in the Bornean Rainforest communities uh, by investing a 5.2, just $5.2 million over 10 years. That's really not a lot of money for the, for the communities that are front facing at these zoonotic hotspots, one of which being in Borneo. And this, these investments were made, you know, to provide healthcare and sustainable jobs. Now, this is an interesting model in that uh, Health and Harmony was, was launched within this community and in, in conversations with community members to try to get a better understanding of, okay, well, you know, if, if the only means of economic input for a family living in this kind of zoonotic hotspot is to be undertaking deforestation practice, having to go into these kind of zoonotic hotspot zones and, and, and you know, farm wood and farm for wild game as, as the only means of economic input, you know, that, that puts a lot of families at risk of, of getting infected with these zoonotic viruses. And so in speaking with these community members, 
what can they do you know, to, to break that dependence upon deforestation as the only means of economic input for a family, while also, you know, you know, ensuring that they have a, a good jobs program that they that they that these communities actually want. So in listening to these communities, a lot of the time members brought up the need for health care. They talked about, well, how can we ensure a healthcare system? How can we be trained in contact tracing, community health working, you know, what what type of healthcare system can be built out here to break this dependence upon you know, deforestation is the only means of economic input. And so through this model, over this 10 year period, Health and Harmony published a paper um, in PNOS recently that showed that by having these targeted investments, there was a 90.6 reduction in logging households. So that is a major reduction in risk. Um, a complete halt of primary forest loss, comparable reforestation, 67% uh, redu reduction in infant, mort infant mortality, significant decrease in incidences of malaria, TB, neglected tropical diseases and diabetes, and then really just the amount of carbon that was contained by reducing that dependence on deforestation, $65.3 million in above ground carbon was recaptured into the environment. So Health and Harmony has now replicated this model in other zoonotic disease hotspot areas in Indonesia, Madagascar, and Brazil. So we know that this works. We know that this can have a, an impact at the community level, at the individual level, and also at the environmental and, and global level. And so yeah, how, how can this model now be scaled up? You know, research has shown that there's 500 of these similar zoonotic disease hotspots around the world. Um, and how can you prevent these outbreaks at the source and also make sure that the containment infrastructure is in place so that if there is an outbreak, there is a, a robust healthcare system as close to the point of contact that would allow for that person to be managed and cared for and not have it turn into a photo global pandemic. And so how can we, we need consistent funding for the zoonotic hotspot countries um, that is in compliance with the WHO's international health regulations and the global health security agenda. And obviously this shouldn't only be sitting on the shoulders of the United States. You know, if we're able to contribute $2.5 billion, this will be a very cost effective <laughs> investment that could attract other global donors. So using a similar model to the existing global fund for HIV AIDS and tuberculosis, where, you know, it's a multilateral financing mechanism. There's many countries across the world that are investing into the continuation and, and proliferation of this project. How can a similar global movement pandemic proof the planet in a way that serves local communities at the source? And this is a very popular proposal. So just wanted to show some of the groups that are in alignment here. Uh, the, the list goes on. This is, this is a very popular proposal. Uh, just wanted to show that for you all. We are on board. We're on the trying to be on the right side of history and really trying to do everything we can to stop COVID at the source and ensure that these health, these robust healthcare systems are available everywhere. So what's next? You know, I, I said I was going to be speaking a bit about global vaccination efforts as well. And I think this graph on the left, unfortunately, shows the situation that we're currently in. So this is a, a representation of the vaccination gra gap. Um, you know, at the end of April 2021, a percent of the total population uh, that has received at least one dose. And so we're seeing a very distinct discrepancy between the global north and global south, high income countries and low income countries. Um, and this is this is vaccine apartheid. So we should call it for what it is. Um, this is a system that has, you know, been proliferated over generations and, and unfortunately is now being there's there's now pandemic profiteers that are taking the publicly funded vaccine. So the Moderna vaccine in particular was 100% funded by our public tax dollars and then extracting private profits from selling that vaccine to the world. And so we're doing everything we can to actually break uh, that connection between a publicly financed vaccine that is meant to be for the people. And so I just wanted to put up a few uh, opportunities to get involved here. Um, we're actually having an event this coming Thursday with some truly amazing global change makers. Um, health, health, Matthew Rose from Health Gap um, has been active in, in, in continuing the, the fight for expanding the global fund for HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria, and is very active in the access to medicine space. Um, Lena Menegi is, is very active with MSF India and can speak to you know, the disparities in care within the global north and global south. And Preeti Raja Christel is, is a, an amazing executive director for IMAC who's going to be speaking to what a system that is not dependent upon intellectual property can look like to ensure that everyone has access to these vaccinations. So I'm going to actually put, um, I did include some links in the chat here. So there actually is, I'm going to do a quick call to action. There's some ways to get involved here. Um, 
everyone here can sign on to this petition. Um, you know, Joe Biden is, is heading, this is the next kind of major peak of our campaign. President Biden is heading to the G7 summit on June 11th. Um, and so this, poll, this, this petition that I circulated is to send him off with a clear message that we need a plan to vaccinate the world. And that means not just breaking the patent on these publicly financed innovations, these vaccines, but also ensuring a robust investment in global vaccine manufacturing so that these, this novel mRNA technology that can save countless lives is able to be produced locally and owned by countries and not dependent upon the global north for distribution. So this is very different than a charity-based model where we're just giving our excess donations to low-income countries. We wanna make sure that these vaccines are produced locally in a safe and globally recognized manufacturing hub and has done so in a way that allows, if the next pandemic comes around, these vaccines can be ramped up in production at a much quicker rate than what we've seen with, with COVID-19. And also if you're a public health worker, um, health professional or student, the second petition is, is for healthcare experts as we're calling them to also call on the Biden administration for this global plan to vaccinate everyone everywhere. And so lastly, I know a lot of people on this call, I recognize a lot of wonderful familiar faces have been active in our, in our pressure campaign against Moderna um, here in Massachusetts. So here's a few of the news articles over the last year of those efforts. And so that's why I originally met you, Amar, and, and I see a, a lot of friendly faces on here. Carrie is on here. Alan has been a number of our actions. Um, so thank you for everyone for participating in these. We're not, we're not slowing down. Um, the statement made by the Biden administration early last month around entering into negotiations for a TRIPS waiver that would waive intellectual property is just the beginning. Nego starting negotiations is not a TRIPS waiver. We have a lot more we need to do. And so we're going to be continuing to push on this campaign and do everything we can to get the Biden administration to end vaccine apartheid as quickly as possible. And so here's just a way to get involved. Um, if anyone here would like to get involved in the Right to Health Action, uh, the link is also in the chat that I just shared. Um, and we're gonna, we, we have state teams across the whole country. And so, you know, I'm, I'm a leader here in Massachusetts and I'm more than happy to follow up with anyone that would like to get involved. So I know we're well over time and I appreciate everyone giving me the opportunity to speak today and, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Awesome, great. Thank you so much, Chris. Much. That, that was really great. Um, so, so yeah, we, I mean, we've gone over a little bit